Um, we are so fortunate in a program that I think it was Jordan who pointed out is its own startup trying to figure out if it's going to go public or <laughs> get sold. Uh, to have with us tonight John Medved, who is, uh, of course, leading venture capital in Israel, and I would say globally, really rethinking how it's done, how investment is done, how transformation is done, how we pick winners, how we propel them to growth, how we make a difference in the world. I think most of you know that John is leading Arn Crowd. I think it made a billion three worth of investments. A million four. A million four. Every dollar counts, right? We know how hard it is to raise it and spend it. Um, in over 200 investments I have written down uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and I also just want to read one thing that uh, the Jerusalem Post said. Uh, they said that it has taken our cut only a matter of months to become one of Israel's most active funds. And of course, John was named one of the 10 most influential Americans who have impacted Israel. We're really, really grateful to have you, John. Thank you for your support. Thank you for writing in the Color Venture Review for us. Uh, in the next month, those of you uh, on our mailing list will get a PDF. And thank you to Peter Bamberger. Is Peter still here? For helping to make this possible. We're truly grateful. So thanks, Peter. And welcome, John. I'm going to see if I can use the uh, old-fashioned microphone since that one was bothering me. Can you hear me OK? In the back, great. Um, I want to cover a couple of topics tonight and hopefully leave some time for some discussion. I want to talk a little bit about the Israeli ecosystem. I want to take a 10-year look back, okay, since this is a 10th anniversary. Happy birthday. Uh, and I want to look a little bit forward. I want to talk to you about some of the changes that we're attempting to make in the uh, nature of venture finance and then share some cool company stories. And if we can do all that in the time allotted, we'll be ahead of the game. Um, you've now been disclaimed, so I can make forward-looking statements. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the Israeli tech ecosystem. <clears throat> in the old days, I used to have to put slides up like this that would come from a department of the Israeli government, from a Zionist organization. Now I let the Davos people do it for me. But Israel really has become recognized as number one or number two in venture capital innovation. That's not news to you, because that's why you're here. Uh, but for many people around the world, it's still news. Now, what is really news is the extraordinary numbers of dollars that were invested in Israel uh, this past year. It's, it's, it's just incredible. We're over $8 billion of, of venture capital uh, put to work with our startups. Um, this is up dramatically from the year before, but look at that staircase. Anybody's business would be incredibly proud to show those kinds of numbers. This is an ecosystem, right? This is the collective here. And you can see how the growth has just been, uh, you know, just in, uh, dramatic and steady. And my prediction, by the way, is that this year will be over $10 billion uh, invested in Israeli venture capital. Come back and see me. At the end of the year, if I'm wrong, then we'll, I'll have to take you guys to lunch or something. <laughs> now, what's more important than investment is exits, right? You want to see not just you're plowing money into cool startups like Constantine's uh, brain company or uh, some of the ideas that uh, Obichi uh, was uh, sharing from uh, uh, Kenya or sports tech incubators out of uh, uh, Indianapolis uh, with Jordan. Um, but Israeli exits last year hit another all-time record, 22 billion, 21.7 to be, we're rounding it up to 22. That is an unbelievable number. Look, by the way, at the data in terms of what the decade was. The decade was 111 billion in exits. And what's amazing, by the way, it's 8.5% of the U.S. number, right? That makes perfect sense, right? We're on, the, we're on par with the size of Israel's population in the U.S.? No, no. Uh, it, we're, per capita, way, way ahead of the U.S., which, of course, really, in my opinion, is the leading innovation market. But look at the percentage of transactions, right? There were uh, over 130 
acquisitions, that's 16% of the U.S. total. So Israel's becoming quite an important location. And the, the numbers per deal are way, way up. Uh, I was doing a little bit of sort of browsing before this event to look at what the headlines were like in 2010 and 2011. And you would see a headline, so-and-so sold this company for $20 million. You know, this company raised $5 million. This wouldn't even get a listing, okay, in Israel's press today. It's just not interesting, right? If you're not selling a company for a billion dollars, if you're not raising money at a billion dollars, they're now in the country over 30 unicorns, okay? You just, you're, you know, you're, you're toast, you're chopped liver, okay? It, it's a, just a whole different order of magnitude in terms of the exit environment. Now, this is when you look back, you can see that the growth in a decade has been an order of magnitude. We've grown this thing 10 times, okay? In 2010, 884 million. 2019, 8.2 or 8.3 billion. That's a 10x. Look at the uh, capital raised, okay, over the decade. Decade was 11 billion. Okay, we're now doing that in a year, okay, almost. And look at the M&A activity. Okay, the M&A activity, you know, was 2.54 billion back in 2009. I told you 22 billion this year. And again, in terms of the size, look at the transactions, right? There were nine big transactions. They were all in the 100, 200 million dollar range. That's it. That's all you got. Not the billion dollar deal. So things have changed here just unbelievably over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, a book was published. Okay, literally, we're on the 10th anniversary of this book, Startup Nation. And when you think about the impact it's had on the country's brand, on our sort of recognition around the world, everyone calls us the Startup Nation. It's just, it, it flows off the tongue easily. We argue whether it should really be scale-up nation or innovation nation. But this book has had a huge impact and it's also celebrating its 10th birthday. Now, you can also look at this from a perspective outside of Israel to see you know, what was going around in, in the rest of the world. And it turns out, by the way, that the rest of the world, especially US, also grew by a factor of 10. Okay, uh, it really was an, you know, a remarkable, I started looking at the numbers and the US investment numbers went up dramatically over the decade. But something weird happened, which is that in this 2009 to 2011 period, so many companies that we now take for granted were, were set up. And this is important to remember for a number of reasons. One. As an entrepreneur, don't fall in love with this notion that you build something and then you sell it in a year or two and you live happily ever after. It takes a decade of work. One of the reasons why venture capital funds are usually set up, at least in the uh, US and in Israel, for as 10-year events, sometimes they're eight years with a couple of years of extension, is because it takes time. You, in a typical fund, you're investing over a three or four-year investment period, and then you have the building and the harvesting. But it's, it's not something that happens overnight. And on the other hand, you somehow begin to lose perspective. Like most of us, we thought, well, how long have we had iPads? I'd say a couple decades, right? No, it's 10 years old. The iPad was 2010. Okay, the iPhone, the first iPhone, 2006. Okay, it's really, it's, it's not that long. So on the one hand, 10 years is enough time to seem like it's a, I mean, especially if you're 20, 25, 10 years seems like a lifetime or half a lifetime. Uh, not for me, unfortunately. But uh, the, the reality is that 10 years is a very interesting piece of time because it can you know, really bring dramatic change. I think Obici's talked about how we've gone from you know, developing to developed in just a couple of decades. But really, the startup nation has come of age here in the last 10 years, and I would dare say that technology and venture worldwide has come of age in a, in a big time. Now, today, the, the real battleground is over AI. 
Okay, if you're starting a company and you don't have an AI angle, just start again. Okay, don't even, don't even try to go there. Right, if you're making a pitch to a venture capitalist and there's nothing having to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence in your pitch, you've got a huge problem today. Okay, it's the only way to start getting VCs to drool, okay, and to get excited and to sort of, you know, actually want to follow up. You've got to have it. Now, you look at the data, and this is data of a year old, and it's, and it's unfortunately out of date, and I've got to get new data. You'll see an interesting phenomena in terms of the fight for startup supremacy in the AI world. And the U.S., of course, is number one, but duking it out for, you know, literally in almost a dead heat for number two is China and Israel. Now, this is not per capita adjusted. This is Israel has as many AI startups as the entire nation of China. That is absurd. Okay, that should give you an idea of what is going on here is simply sui generis of a different, different nature, which is pretty hard to understand when you, unless you live here like you guys do. Now, this is how you could actually visualize it in terms of... I don't think they even have all 400 companies up on this chart. But that's what it looks like in, in AI. Now, if you look at digital health, Israel's also got leadership position. Even when you look at the variety of areas you can invest in in digital health. And then ag tech, there are you know, over hundreds of these companies in ag tech. And in the automotive space, you guys know that Israel's the new Motown, right, with about 600 new startups in the wake of Mobileye and whatnot. And in FinTech, extraordinarily strong, lots of activity. In Industry 4.0, tons of companies. In cybersecurity, forget about it. You can't put 700 companies on a slide, so you have to just take like a subset and do Boston, Israel. And then you've got Food Tech, which is now the flavor of the year. We just have two new Food Tech incubators at our crowd. Everybody's crazy about Beyond Meat. And the future of, of uh, cell-grown uh, beef and fish and all of that. Uh, and then, of course, you've got travel tech. Now, by the way, there are another 40 of these slides in terms of there's a very big business in this country developing these slides of ecosystems. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but I think when you get to travel tech, you stop. So th the question you know, is often asked, not maybe by this group who have been living here and studying here and whatnot, but certainly outside the country, what the hell is going on in Israel? Why does Israel, with its population of just over 9 million people, outperform this way in the innovation economy worldwide? And without getting too Jewy about this, um, I'm going to share with you my own sort of uh, way of understanding this. And this is that we have a long-standing tradition in this country of turning curses into blessings. I actually look at it more in a uh, sort of Asian martial arts uh, format, not that I am a practitioner myself, but those who are, tell me that one of the key elements of being good at martial arts is knowing how to take the energy which is directed against you by your opponent and turn it back against them, right? In other words, you use that negative energy and you turn it, you know, from your perspective into a positive energy. So that's sort of like, how do you take a curse into a blessing. Now you go back in the Bible and there's the you know, stories of uh, Bilam and uh, Balak and you know, donkeys that are talking and, 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 and all of a sudden you know, this curse that which was given by the greatest cursor of all time becomes the blessing that literally every Jew every morning when he goes to synagogue says it. You know, we don't, we, what we say is, was, was meant to be a curse and it turned out to be an incredible blessing. So I'm going to go through a couple of modern day examples of this phenomenon. There is no water in this country. Now, talking to a Tel Aviv group after the last couple of days about there's no water, that's got to be tough. But in, 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 in general, this is what the country looks like. That's a curse, right? Well, think again. It's actually a blessing. Because if you don't have a lot of water, you become masters of water. The country here recycles 85% of its water. Those cherry tomatoes, which we all love, you do not want to know where that water started, okay? It is not the first time we're using it. Uh, 
If you look at the closest competitor in terms of a country, it's Spain. They recycle 15% of their water, and the U.S. recycles a hefty 1% of its water. Okay, we invented drip irrigation, continue to be the leading country purveying that kind of technology, and the modern day reverse osmosis processes which we're using in desal, invented, perfected in Israel, and today the majority of our drinking water comes from the sea. Another, is that working? Okay, thank you. Better? Huh? <laughs> huh? No? Better, thank you. Uh, another example of a curse, these guys are alive, they are not dead, okay? These are live soldiers, just dead tired, okay? They're lying on the ground. They are alive but sleeping. Uh, no, I, I, have to, I, have, I had people say, what are you showing dead bodies on your slides for? I said, no, these are just really tired soldiers. And uh, this is a curse, right? The fact that all of our kids, or the vast, vast majority of our kids, go and spend years in the Army. I've got two sons who've been officers for five years. If you're in the Air Force, it could be nine or 11 years. You're in Talpiotis. I mean, a big chunk of time. But it's not just that. As a parent of a kid who has to go out and keep you safe, it's sort of weird psychologically to know that you know, our future, our, our living, depends on these kids. It's a curse. Well, think again. It's actually a blessing. Because on the one hand, uh, these kids are at risk. But on the other hand, they are learning to be not, let's say, as narcissistic as some Southern California college students could be. I can pick on Southern California because I was brought up there. Okay? Uh, they become mission driven, right? They learn that there's a, a something larger than self. You learn to work as part of a team. 10% of the soldiers become officers in the IDF. Um, you learn to take risks, okay? And you learn that, that, that risks actually have real consequences. People can get hurt and worse. But on the other hand, it's what's most bizarre is that they've done studies on life expectancy of Israeli men who go to the army and those who don't go to the army. And those who go to the army live at the moment about four years longer on average. So you give three years on average and you get four. Now, one is given in the beginning of life, one is probably <laughs> tacked on at the end, but it's not a bad deal. The bottom line is that this is not a curse, this is actually a, a great blessing. And of course, from the startup community, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere without the army feeding us uh, what it feeds us. Now, another curse is that we don't have a market. Um, you have to be nuts to want to be the king of Tel Aviv and to sell in this country. Have any of you ever tried to sell a product here? Okay, forget about it. Okay, just forget about it. Don't even go there. It's nuts. The, you know, Israelis don't like to leave you with much profit. Okay, it's just not... And I can say that, some of you can't. Um, but the reality is that it's a very tough crowd here. And it's a tiny crowd. It means nothing. It's not like you're in China or in Brazil or in the U.S. where you just fall out of bed and there's a market or Africa, okay, where there's like a lot of people and they need services. In Israel, we're a tiny little country. And so that's a curse, right? Well, not really because it's a blessing. And what's the blessing? Our entrepreneurs are forced from the beginning to go global, right? They have to think in global terms. They have to get their butts in gear and go somewhere. And whether it's going to Asia or going to Europe or going to the States, you've got to tackle a global market. And that might be obvious to you here uh, you know, at Tel Aviv University. For most entrepreneurs in the world, it's not obvious at all. Like I'm sitting with... Uh, Brazilians telling them that I want to see their business plans and I want to invest with them. And uh, I get about a half a dozen plans. They're all in Portuguese. All of their financials are in reais, okay, which is a, uh, a currency which fluctuates, you know, wildly. And who in the hell wants to deal with this? Okay, and I talk to them and I say, okay, guys, you're talking to an international venture capital guy. I do invest around the world. But haven't you thought about like, what it means to talk to somebody internationally? And they go, no, not really. You're actually the first person ever said they were interested. We've always thought that we're going to be Brazilian. We've got a big enough market. Who needs to go anywhere else? Why do I need to deal with English? Forget about it. 
And, and I, it just like dawned on me that that's probably the mindset of many, many Indian entrepreneurs and Chinese entrepreneurs and Brazilian entrepreneurs and African entrepreneurs and certainly Americans. The world, screw the world. Okay, I don't need to, I don't need to go out and get global, but that is a totally different Israeli headset. Because the Israeli, when they start their company, it's all they're thinking about, is how do I achieve world domination in my chosen niche? And that's a, a blessing from that lack of market. Another curse is that we're not, in some places, the most popular country. I think we're growing in popularity, okay? I think that more people actually like us than dislike us. It's an, it's an obsession here, right? Let's face it. Israel is obsessed with its image and, and, and Today, with the leaders of the world here, everyone's all a titter, except for Jerusalemites who are in panic from the, the roads. And that's why I'm, I'm here as a refugee today. Uh, <laughs> um, but the reality is that there are people out there who still don't like us, some, some of them. That's a blessing. Why? Because when you live with existential risk, when you have some people who don't like you and actually like to kill you, and would develop nuclear weapons to execute on that plan, it sort of puts in perspective the risk of starting a company. I mean, with all due respect, what's the worst thing that's going to happen if you start a company and fail? You start again. You start again, exactly. And your chances are better the second time than the first time. If these three people are now meeting me, pitching me deals, Okay, and we have here a winner. Somebody who has started a company, raised money, done it, sold successfully. Unfortunately, you're a loser. Okay? <laughs> you have tried and failed and lost money. And you, my friend, are a newbie. Okay, you've never done it before. It's your first startup. So I think it's gonna be pretty easy, like who statistically makes the best investment if everything else is equal? The winner. Right, the serial entrepreneur. By the way, not in terms of total return, okay? Because serial entrepreneurs have a much better batting average, they have a better percentage win, but they don't create the biggest companies. The biggest companies in the world were created by first-timers, okay? And, and you can think in your mind about Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or uh, Mark, you know, Benny, there are all kinds of people. They, the people who start for the first time build the biggest companies. But between these other two, okay, the loser and the newbie, I think most people would say, screw the loser, <laughs> he's lost money, we're going to the newbie, right? That's a sort of a normal approach, and it's completely wrong, right? The odds are about two to one in favor of the loser, right? In other words, a person who's tried and failed has experience, and you want to invest in that person. Now, you got to look at the failure mode and see that, he was ethical, and then he worked well with his investors, and he didn't fight with his team members, and a bunch of other things you want to make sure didn't happen. But in general, it's very, very good that you've tried and failed. And that's the concept that I think this risky attitude in this country generates. Failure is simply part of the process. Okay, we live with risk. We live with people sometimes who would like us dead. Screw them. I'm going to go live my life. It's unfortunately way too short. And I'm not going to be afraid. Okay? Lo lefached klal, as we say, from you know, the great Rebbe of uh, uh, Bratzlav, Rebbe Nachman, who said the whole world is a very narrow bridge. Right? And we've got to go through this bridge. And some of us will take longer, and some of us will take shorter. The key element is not to be afraid. No fear. And in this country... There really is no fear. I mean, you're reminded by it. I, I, I simply, over the last couple of weeks, have been dealing with a very big conference coming up, uh, which you're all invited to. All you have to do is send me an email saying, Kohler talk, and you've got a ticket to the Arkrod Summit in three weeks from now, which is really the coolest ticket in the, in the, in the, in the country. If you haven't, how many have been to our summit before? Tell them. Okay, come. You're welcome. We, we, we're looking for a little bit younger you know, more entrepreneurial crowd, so you guys are more than welcome to join us. But we're getting some feedback from some people abroad who are saying, wait a minute, maybe this is not the year to come, the Iranians and missiles and da-da-da-da-da. 
And it's, it's, it's just bizarre because, like, you, you know, there is a coronavirus going wild out of uh, Wuhan. That's something to be afraid of. You know, when you got Iron Dome, you know, stay calm, okay? I mean, that's, that's the reality. Anyway, uh, th this, this is an interesting uh, discussion. Now, one of the other things which this leads to is an absurd belief in the future. Israelis are crazy optimists. We love to complain, but we believe in the future and we vote in the bedroom. And the, and the voting <laughs> takes place as a result of huge birth rate. So by the way, 10 years ago, we joined the OECD. It's a 10 year anniversary, 2010, was when Israel joined the OECD, the sort of exclusive club of the uh, most advanced economies. And today we by far have the highest birth rate because there's a correlation to this attitude towards risk and, and, and loving life and, and producing children. Right now, the Israeli birth rate is 3.2 per average woman. Average woman. That means that includes women who never get married, women who can't have children, God forbid. And uh, it's, it's, it's really quite an interesting stat. And the last curse. The last curse is we are a tiny speck. Right? When you look at this picture, you see how small Israel is. It actually generated a, a bunch of chuckles from a group of Japanese that I was showing this slide to. And I said, what's the joke? And they said, we never thought that Japan was so huge before. Okay? <laughs> because they looked at Japan versus Israel. That's a really big country, that Japan there, uh, you know, relative to Israel. But the, the reality is we have no natural resources to speak of. Now a little bit of natural gas in the sea. And that forces us to be blessed with human resources, right? When you don't have things which you can dig out like the Australians have, you have to dig inside, okay? You have to create the world's highest per capita percentage of Nobel Prize winners. You have to educate your kids right. Today, Israel graduates the second highest percentage of kids in the world from four-year uh, institutions, right after Canada, which is number one. And number three is that we... Uh, spend the highest percentage of dollars in, on civilian R&D as a function of uh, GDP. So, with that said, let's talk a little bit about venture capital, okay, and what's going on with venture capital and how we're disrupting it, and then we'll talk about some technology and hopefully save some time for some questions. Venture capital has always been important to entrepreneurs, to professional sort of endowment funds, it's now becoming increasingly important to the average investors. Because there's a, f a phenomena going on out there called unicorns, which basically, which today, by the way, worldwide, there are almost 500 of them now. Um, basically, companies wait forever to go public. In the good old days, tech companies went public early. Many of them, even before they got to a billion dollar valuation. Can you believe that? Now, what did that result in? That resulted in the fact that the public market could create huge value for you, the investor. You could invest in an Apple or a Microsoft or an uh, Amazon. You look at those, uh, the left side of this chart, and you'll see all this green. That green is the the times your money you made on these iconic Amazon is the big, the big line, Apple, Microsoft, Oracle. You made more than a thousand times your money. Now the reason you made so much money is the blue, which I don't know if you can see it on that chart, it's so low, that was the price of their IPOs. Their IPOs were so early they were priced at a billion or so or less. Now you look today and you see huge blue, right? You see big values at the IPO, and where did the green go? It's almost non-existent. So if you're lucky, you can make 10 times, which is a wonderful thing to make, but it ain't 1,000 times your money on a really successful company. You buy Facebook and you hold Facebook. Facebook here is uh, seven and a half times. So if you bought the IPO at Facebook, you made seven and a half times your money. You bought the IPO at Amazon, you made over 2,000 times your money. So what does that tell you? 
That tells you that you're an investor, and someday all of you will be, because you're all going to make some money you need to invest if you're not already investing today. you got to invest in private companies, because today the companies that go public are already too inflated. Your big returns are going to be in the private market. So you look at you know, uh, venture capital global funding has also gone quite up, like the earlier graph I showed you about Israel. Last year was down slightly because of China. Because China has become a big part of the global venture scene, but last year did not have a great year. And if you look at the, oh, so did, I, did that get erased there? No, it got erased. Ooh. Okay. So sorry that the data is gone. Uh, <laughs> you could have seen how the, uh, uh, it, it, it played out according to year, but you'll see the bottom line, which there now are over 500 unicorns worldwide representing almost $2 trillion of market cap, if you will, and have raised, in terms of creating that $2 trillion, $400 billion. So it's about 5x on the money total for the, the crop of, uh, of unicorns. And you look at the returns of venture capital as an asset class versus other asset classes, and you see a remarkable set of stats that literally even private equity, which we know has been spectacular, VC almost is 2x on a 25-year basis. Right, almost 60%, 57% of the number is there, annual IRR on a 25-year basis for venture capital. It's, it's something extraordinary. And that leads the leading investors, people like Yale University, their endowment, to commit 20% of their endowment to venture capital investing. Now, most asset allocators will say that you know, maybe 20% to alts, to alternative investments, but 20% to venture, that's high. You know, the problem for most of us and for your families and for other people you know is they have no venture capital. How many people are investing in venture capital? Millions? No. Hundreds of thousands? No. Tens of thousands? No. Not even really thousands. There might be one or 2,000 real investors worldwide in venture capital. That's it. It's tiny. It's this little oligarchy. You can't, how do you invest in venture capital? You come from a family. I have no idea. This is, I'm making it up. <laughs> Your family has worked hard in real estate. You've saved $200 million. Okay, you've got, you're running the family office. And you came back from this talk and you said, Dad, Mom, we got to start putting money to work in venture capital and you happen to live God knows where. How in the hell does he do it? To pick up his phone, call a broker at Goldman or Morgan, and say, hey, I got a, this guy told me I'd do venture capital, I should do two or three percent, that means five million dollars, how do I invest that five million dollars? You don't, it, you are, unless you call me, or you know, work with someone like us. But the reality is that it's really, really hard, because what are your options? Your options are put money in a fund, right? A venture fund. What is the minimum LP commitment for most venture funds today? A limited partner. It's a million if you're really lucky and it's probably not a good fund. The minimums for real funds are $5 million. So he could go take his $5 million, bet on one manager when Obichi sets up his fund, he can give $5 million to Obichi, and hope for the best. Not very diversified. Okay, lots of risk, probably too much risk. You have another option. You could contact 20 of your classmates here and say, I'll write you a $100,000 or $200,000 angel check. That's really hard. The legal, the diligence, again, not a particularly good solution. So really, those are your two choices. Go to funds or go direct into companies. And so we set up this idea that I had come up with having been a venture manager and an entrepreneur for like about 40 years. And I said, wait a minute, why in the hell can't you pick up the phone and call Goldman? Why can't you put $50,000, not into Obichi's fund, but to 20 Obichis? 
Just the way you buy mutual funds or ETFs, why can't we do that? So that was the impetus behind the setting up of our crowd. We were doing it for Israel because here we have an unfair advantage and a lot of deal flow and there's a lot of interest. And now we've grown to be a global platform. And we're in line with what the new chairman of the SEC, Jay Clayton, is talking about. Because he's saying, look, if growth opportunities have shifted not all the way, but to a substantial extent into our private markets, not the non-public companies, and ordinary investors don't have access to them, that's not good. Okay, so we're pretty excited that he's sort of picked this up and is actually changing regulatory conditions to allow companies like our crowd to take advantage of these changes. So we are about seven years into our journey, and we're very proud to be, for the second year in a row, the most active venture investor in Israel, which means that we're making the most investments. We're all over this market, and we're doing it democratically by taking and solving problems, not just for the $200 million family office, but for the dentist with $2 million, we're working on what we call accredited investors, people who have a minimum amount of capital. In the U.S., you have to have a million dollars. Outside of your home in Israel, you have to have $2 million. But there are different regulations in different countries. We work with what are called, in Hebrew, they, it's funny, they call them in Hebrew, mashkiim kshirim, or kosher investors. Okay, it has nothing to do with whether they have a yarmulke on their head or not. Okay, it has to do with their uh, bank account. Um, the platform that we've built consists of two different kinds of products. We offer the funds, so the Obichis of the world, when they build their funds, we have now 20 different funds, and we have 200 company investments, where we offer individual investments where you can actually put money into a startup, except you're not just writing an angel check. You're actually investing in a single company venture capital organization. It's set up with an LPGP structure. We're the GP. Individuals are LPs. The minimums for our funds are $50,000. The minimums for our company investments are $10,000. And at the bottom of our platform is 40,000 individuals who have signed up around the world from over 180 countries and about 1,000 institutions or corporations or large family offices that are investing as well. We're now, the blue here are all the countries of the world where our active investors are coming from at the moment. We have a lot of work to do with Beachy in Africa. Uh, but uh, we're getting there. And uh, we now have offices in 13 or 12 different locations, 13. And if you look at our deal flow, what's really interesting is in the beginning, we started, it was all deal flow from Israel. And now it's starting to become almost 50% outside of Israel. That's our goal for the end of next year to hit for sure 50%. And at some point, we'll, we'll continue to do Israel, but as we grow, we want to be more and more global in terms of our presence. So we give people the ability to either select your own startup investments and obviously do it as a diversified portfolio. Don't try to pick one or two investments. Bad idea. Build a portfolio starting with at least 10, okay, because of the venture power law, which if you don't know what that is, go read Peter Thiel's book. And then take funds, okay, because funds give you that diversification as well. Now, we have a bunch of funds. As I mentioned, some are sector-focused, some are generalist funds. The one I want to share with you to give you a little idea of how our stuff works is a fund <coughs> called the OC50, which is our portfolio index fund. Um, when we do our diligence on the direct investments, we're screening hundreds of companies every month. We then deep dive into about 10% of them, and we ultimately select between 1% or 2%. We set terms just like any venture organization. We lead the investment with our own capital, about 5% of it, and then we open the investment to the crowd, both the individuals and the institutions, at the same terms and the same prices. And these are our numbers on the bottom, about $1.4 billion of uh, assets under management, 10,000 companies vetted, 200 invested in, et cetera, et cetera. And when we look at companies, we have a pretty simple diligence checklist. We're looking first and foremost at people. We're looking at are they addressing big markets? Uh, do they have a simple value proposition because we're running an online platform and if it's too complicated, it's simply not gonna work for us? Is it differentiated both in its product and its uh, value prop, 
Okay, does the company have traction? Are they making progress on their own? And do they have sponsorship? Are, they, are there other smart investors around the table, other good board members? Who else is there pushing this wagon up the hill? We've been very successful in terms of having had uh, 36 exits. These are some of the exits we've had so far. And we're now distributing our products with major banks around the world. So working with people like UOB in Singapore, the National Bank of Australia, with Reliance in, uh, in India, and we just announced a huge deal with Stiefel, who's a very, very big uh, distributed bank in America, about a million clients, 2,200 financial advisors, and I was just there last week launching this uh, with them. So our index fund, which happens to be the first product that we're offering together with Stiefel, is actually a single fund with 50 companies. We take 50 of the companies that we've invested in on the platform, we put $1,000 in each company for each $50,000 investment. It's sector and stage agnostic, meaning you get early stage companies all the way to late stage companies, and you get companies spread across a variety of sectors that can be uh, everything from cybersecurity to ag tech to med tech to artificial intelligence, et cetera. And if you look at the results, they've been quite remarkable. Um, and we've had five exits in a little less than two years. These are the exits we had and the payouts. Companies like Beyond Meat, which was the hottest IPO we got in before it was a public company. Uber's IPO, we played via Jump, which was a private company. We backed Series A at a $10 million valuation, sold it to Uber for $200 million. Got, uh, We got half cash and half stock uh, and others as well. Portfolio is still quite alive, 45 other companies waiting to exit, and there are good ones there that you might have heard of, such as Lemonade or uh, Zebra Medical, BrainQ, uh, and a, a host, a Halo, and a host of others that are going to be. Can you share the time? I'm, sure, I'm not sure if I missed the timeline for those multiples. Or so the, the, the multiples have been, the whole fund started two years ago. It fully funded in the end of... Uh, 2017, early 18. So we're basically about, you know, a year and a half into it. We have a, a, a net net IRR, we mean net off carry and management fees of a little over 10% uh, a year, which is still low, but we should be in the J curve. If you guys know what a J curve is in venture capital, your NAV, your net asset value, goes down typically in the first couple of years and crosses over anywhere between year three and four. We never went negative here, obviously, with five exits, and we're pretty excited. We expect that the IRR will go up. But the difference between this fund is it's really diversified, so it's more secure. The fact that you've got 50 companies. That will also reduce the impact of the winners, because we have a Beyond Meat, and we only have $1,000 per 50 associated with it. So we're not picking an, an, a preference, but we're creating, a, again, like an ETF uh, kind of uh, uh, structure in the venture world. So, uh, and a bunch of really cool things happening with companies that are still in the portfolio. The thing we're most proud of is something called DPI, which is distributed capital as a function of, pay, of paid in capital. How much money have you invested and how much do you get back already? And uh, that's critical to most investors. Here we're about 20 cents back on the dollar already in this two year period. And that's about two years ahead of the top quartile performance from Cambridge, which is pretty cool. Uh, and these, again, are fair value uh, extrapolations for the different cohorts of this investment. So I've got a few more minutes left. How many minutes do I have? A few more minutes. A few more minutes, OK. <laughs> Target sectors and companies, and I'll shut up. So this is what our portfolio looks like. Again, as I mentioned, very, very diverse in different sectors. A lot in fintech companies like Lemonade, who are totally killing it in uh, uh, insurance, BioCatch, who can tell who you are by how you hold and touch the phone. It's behavioral biometrics. Daily Pay, which is a U.S. company, uh, essentially putting loan sharks out of business, allowing low-salaried workers to get their pay every day, which is what they deserve and they need <clears throat> to be able to make their week. Uh, in cybersecurity, companies like Kenna, who are doing threat detection, CyberNDX, who are going to prevent hackers from taking control of your pacemaker or insulin pump and tell you you will have 30 minutes to live until you, if you don't send this uh, 
million dollar ransom. That's coming, by the way, unfortunately. And we have to be ready to stop it. Companies like Theta Ray, which are in the uh, anti-AML or uh, uh, KYC area using AI. In mobility, companies like Cartica, who are using true AI to do autonomous driving. Innoviz doing LiDAR. RB Robotics, next generation, radar. Companies like C2A who are protecting the car from hackers so they don't run you off a bridge. But at the chip level, again, Cartica is doing just spectacular work. Already orders there for, for you know, quite a large number of cars. And Skytran, which will be moving you at 300 kilometers around uh, cities soon. The first city in the world going to get Skytran is? Mumbai. <laughs> Mumbai. Uh, Mukesh Ambani has promised it. And so what I Mukesh it promises, he usually delivers. I heard Gurgaon in India. Yeah, yeah it's, pretty, it's a pretty exciting project. Um, companies in the ag tech area, Tyrannus, that are flying drones over uh, fields and doing uh, AI-driven data analysis. Tevel, who are using drones to pick fruit, okay, which is really a smart thing. Uh, and CropEx, who are doing wireless uh, uh, drip irrigation by essentially putting sensors into the ground that can also measure uh, phosphates and nitrites and, uh, nitrates and things like that. Um, and we won't go into too many of them. I'd love to show you this video. I can't. Consumer physics, one of my favorites, a little device like this, which you can actually use on uh, corn to know when to harvest it, or coffee about how much moisture is in it. It's providing big data literally empowering poor farmers, okay, who have no access to data can all of a sudden take this device and it says harvest now and drives their yields, you know, uh, much, much higher. Uh, in the artificial intelligence area, companies like Halo, who are uh, creating AI advanced chips for accelerating AI routines, Citru is using AI to uh, essentially stop smugglers with uh, airline passenger bags, you know that 70% of the penetration testing at airports succeed, meaning they fail, right? In other words, you, you get 70% of the knives and the guns through. Don't think about that next time you fly, uh, but it's true. Metaware, which is uh, pre preventing prescription uh, errors at hospitals, which is important, especially since they now have these ER, you know, the electronic record systems where you now have a, a drop-down menu with drugs. And just think what happens when your doctor presses the wrong drug. Is there software to prevent that from going into your body? And the answer is no. Okay, it's unbelievable. There's software to prevent drug-to-drug -drug interaction, but nothing that ties these medical records back to you. So literally, people are being killed uh, by these mistakes that are being made, and Metaware is stopping that. Uh, in healthcare, companies like Site Diagnostics just a month ago was sort of deemed the anti Theranos because they do single pinprick, two drops of blood, and within 10 minutes, a point of care CBC complete blood count. Zebra Medical, who just signed a major deal with Johnson & Johnson Depuy to basically allow you to get a hip replacement or a knee replacement without having to go through a whole CT scan. Simple x-ray and zebra software will suffice. And AlphaTau, who is taking a bite out of cancer so serious that in their first trials, 100% of all the tumor, tumors that were shot with their magic radioactive dart shrunk, and 79% completely disappeared within three days. And it's really, uh, we're very excited about that company. And we don't have time to talk about them. What I do want to end with <laughs> is one company which I love dearly, uh, no, this one I love too, but this one, uh, called Insight Tech, who you'll be hearing a lot about because the Koch brothers are leading a huge second round uh, here. There have been hundreds of millions of dollars invested. We're part of this group. These guys are using focused ultrasound, okay, to essentially solve problems like Parkinson's tremor or actually to cross the blood, the blood brain barrier so that we can deliver anti-Alzheimer drugs directly where they need to go. And it's a huge, huge deal. I just want to sh show you this little video. Uh, this is what Parkinson's disease is. 
disease does to Kimberly's sweater. Uncontrolled movements, shaking and wobbling. I got to the point where I was having difficulty getting dressed. I have a grandson. I couldn't, like, snap his one jeans. I was at a wedding recently and I couldn't dance with my dad. Now, doctors at the University of Maryland Medical Center are experimenting with a brand new treatment, something that's never been done before. It's called MRI guided ultrasound. It's been known for a long time that if you make lesions in certain parts of the brain, you can eliminate some of the uh, symptoms. And that's exactly what this treatment does, except there's no cutting and no surgery. Kimberly underwent this treatment less than a week ago. She says she had to shave her head, but the procedure didn't hurt. The only feeling is intense heat. The results, though, were immediate. She was able to walk. It was just absolutely the most incredible thing in the world. And when we met Kimberly this morning, there was even more emotion because she was able to accomplish something else, running, a favorite hobby that she hasn't been able to do for years. It's turned back the clock for me. You know, I, I have a new lease on life. I can do things that I want to do. I, it, it's a blessing. So we talked before about turning curses into blessings. I think that um, what you guys, many of you, will be embarking on in terms of your own entrepreneurial journeys should keep in mind that it's not just about making money. It's about doing good, about supporting the double bottom line where you can both make money and create blessings. Because whether or not you're feeding people or you're healing them or you're giving them a more democratic pay or you're giving better information in terms of climate so many of these companies are going to make the world better. They're not going to do it by themselves. We still have a lot of other issues that we've got to solve, ethical and uh, morality issues. But this is a great calling, okay, to be part of changing the world with entrepreneurship. You're at a great university, with great professors, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. I want to reiterate that one um, invitation. I don't have time to talk about these companies. I'll have to come to a nut. Is that February 13th, the summit's coming. Go to our website, ask for a ticket, or get a card from me, or send me an email to john at rcrowd, J-O-N at rcrowd.com. Just say Kohler Lecture, and we'll see you in three weeks from today. Thank you. I think we'd have to do questions later. I've got to get to it. I think I got it. I think I got it. Thank you. Thanks.